Two of the series that I sometimes forget are series at all are Darkman and Maniac Cop. Part of the reason is that the first films in each of these trilogies are perfectly capable of being solo entries without the need for expansion. Now, yeah, that's never stopped every movie ever made from being looked at through the lens of being a bankable franchise, but uh, I digress. Sam Raimi's Darkman is a comic book movie long before the Marvel Cinematic Universe and even before his own powerhouse of the Spider-Man trilogy. Liam Neeson is awesome as he is crazy, and the movie almost feels like if Robocop, Looney Tunes, and Get Carter were all rolled into one. Uh, the two sequels lose a few big pieces and don't quite hold up. I mean, how can you go on without Raimi and Neeson? Uh, but they're still pretty fun. Arnold Vosloo does surprisingly well as a titular dark man, and the movie allows the villains to shine even more. Uh, they're fun flicks that'll eventually get the black sheep treatment, but today, is for something else, something a little more maniacal. Maniac Cop is a great drive-in flick that works as a mystery thriller as much as it does an exploitation movie. Now, part of the reason is that the script is written by the legendary Larry Cohen and the direction of William Lustig. Now, Lustig's filmography is the stuff of genre legends, with horror classic Maniac, action exploitation classic Vigilante, and the Maniac Cop trilogy. Off-screen, he created the Blue Underground label that shines a light on horror, foreign, and exploitation classics by cleaning them up and bringing them to a whole new audience. The man is a hero, period. As mentioned above, the trilogy can be disjointed at times, with the first one being able to stand on its own, and the following two being their own continuity. Maniac Cop follows Bruce Campbell, the great mustache Tom Atkins, and Lorene Landon, solving a killer cop spree, then dealing with the revelation that the killer cop has already been killed. Eh, kind of. The supporting cast is filled with William Smith, Richard Roundtree, and of course, Robert Zadar as a titular Maniac Cop. It even has uncredited roles from Lustig's friends Sam Raimi and Uncle Jake LaMotta. The second film goes the interesting and dangerous route of killing off both Campbell and Landon, while making Robert Davi the new zombie cop hunting lead. Lustig felt that Campbell and Landon's stories had already been told, so why not give the task of stopping a maniac cop to a new character? You know, I haven't been to confession in over 20 years, but if the priests looked like you, I probably would have gone more often. Who could be fleshed out and have a new storyline? A new place to go. Now, as much as I love Campbell and Atkins, this may actually be the better movie of the first two. But the black sheep of the series is definitely Maniac Cop 3, Badge of Silence. You see the symbol of anti-justice. But as usual, I'm here to tell you that it ain't that bad of a time. Lustig again wanted to go a different route, and trying to change things up and make it a little more progressive, the film was written with a black lead in mind. But the film was sold with the idea of Robert Davi returning as a lead, so that's what Lustig had to do. The problem there was that Larry Cohen wanted additional pay to basically write a new script, so the cast and crew were sometimes getting pages the same day of filming. While it's fun to wonder what could have been, Maniac Cop 3 delivers the goods in a broken way. The film opens with the series now going full Friday the 13th. Matt Cordell is resurrected by a voodoo priest who gives him his badge and wants him to do his bidding. So basically, Weekend at Bernie's 2 meets Maniac Cop. Get on up. Get on up. Get on up. While the first movie doesn't outright call Cordell a zombie, this film leaves no question whether or not he is the undead. We move to a convenience store robbery in progress where Officer Kate Sullivan is able to stop the assailant, but puts together that the plan was concocted by the store clerk as well. A shootout ensues and Kate is severely injured. This scene is the first of many in the movie that highlights an actor you recognize, <laughs> Jackie Earl Haley. Haley is a robber here and he is clearly having fun. Say what you will about the Nightmare on Elm Street remake, it sucks, we all agree. But Jackie Earl Haley is always watchable, whether it be Watchmen, Dollman, and everything in between. He was even pretty good in The Dark Tower, which is the biggest compliment I can give for that of a movie. I am not even joking. How can you take Matthew McConaughey as a man in black and not nail it? Hate. Yeah. 
choose a pretty face and the world is your oyster. I hope you don't mind me making myself at home. Where I come from, we don't have chicken. <sighs> Officer Sullivan is rushed to the hospital, and while she survives, she is comatose and brain dead. To add insult to injury, the media is pushing the narrative that she is a violent cop that pushed excessive violence to stop the robbery. It doesn't help that the only survivor of the robbery is Earl Haley's Frank Jessup, so of course he is going to do whatever he can to help his case and be set free. Davi's Detective McKinney tries to get the answers out of Jessup and stay with Kate to see if she comes too. And it's here we get an absolutely crazy dream sequence where Kate is walking down the aisle to eventually marry a now burned Cordell. For being comatose for two thirds of the movie, Gretchen Becker does everything she can to give the character some life. Now, the dream sequence doesn't really mesh well with the rest of the movie, or series for that matter, but adds a strange kind of Bride of Frankenstein vibe to the story. When watching the movie, it will feel kind of broken at times. Lustig filmed a little less than 50 minutes worth of footage before calling it quits and walking off set. Producer Joel Swasson came in to finish it up uncredited. Lustig's own company has the film credited to the famous I don't want a f***ing thing to do with this, Alan Smithy. Now honestly, I don't blame Lustig as it sounds like everything he was hoping for kind of fell apart for the production. But back to the movie. Dr. Susan Fowler decides to try and help McKinney in doing everything she can to help revive Officer Sullivan. But the hospital staff has zero interest in helping who is perceived to be a reckless cop. The attention surrounding Kate brings our newly revived maniac cop out of the woodwork and he kills the jerk doctor refuses to help Kate after Dr. Fowler tells McKinney that she followed a large man into the tunnels before losing him, McKinney realizes that can only mean that Cordell has somehow come back. Eh, sure. He follows the tunnels until he meets the voodoo priest, played by Julius Harris. I am not a priest. Some people you are. Now, Harris was an exploitation mainstay, especially for Larry Cohen. But he was also one of the more fun gimmicky Bond villains for the great Roger Moore, playing the hook-handed Teehee in Live and Let Die. See, Cordell in this movie is much more like Jason Voorhees, with the ability to appear anywhere at any time and kill in inventive ways. And regardless how ridiculous this series went to, it really should have had more sequels, more Cordell, more killing, each time becoming more and more decayed. <laughs> It'd have been great. The reporters who first broke the story too are dealt with by Cordell, who continues his quest to clear Kate Sullivan's name, clearly something that he feels was never done properly for him. And he eventually frees up Jessup to create a distraction that leads to one of the best lines in the movie. Great, I shot my lawyer. The chaos caused by that allows Cordell to bring Kate's body back to the priest to have her resurrected, again having shades of Bride of Frankenstein weaved into the story. And bit of uh, Bernie Lomax thrown in for good measure. Get on up. Before McKinney realizes Kate is gone, he deals with Jessup and his two pals who are along for the violent ride in a pretty cool action set piece. It's the third entry, go big or go home. Now the priest is unable to bring Kate back to a state of undead as her soul won't allow it. Almost her version of fighting back and wanting to stay a deceased good cop rather than become a zombie body to Cordell's Clyde. Cordell kills the voodoo priest and inadvertently lights Kate's body on fire before picking her up and catching himself on fire. The whole scene is great looking from a set decoration of the underground church to the stunt work and special effects with Cordell. McKinney and Fowler escape the burning building only to be chased by a still on fire Matt Cordell driving a police car. It's fucking great. The final chase is a good one with two cars battling like Roman carriages and Robert Davi emptying clip after clip into Cordell. It ends with a crash and a final goodbye of our beloved maniac cop, courtesy of an ending stinger that would go unrewarded. Back in the morgue, the charred body of Kate is wheeled in next to the remains of Cordell, who puts his burnt hand over hers. Maniac Cop 3 is a great time. Sure, it's the weakest of the three films, and you can wonder about what might have been, or if William Lustig had been able to make the movie he wanted to, but that would ignore an exploitation action horror flick that hits all the right notes. It gives Robert Davi the right amount of action while giving us an intensive slasher-like kills and a silly story. Yeah, it falls short of expectations set by the first two films, but it still delivers on what we all need. So grab some friends, a couple of drinks, pour yourself a cold one. Check out Joe Bob Briggs and watch the first two. And by that time, you'll be the right amount of... Uh... Then enjoy part three.
Hey, thanks for watching our show. Please subscribe to our Joe Blow Horror Videos channel. Tell your friends who like this sort of content and turn on the bell to receive notifications for all of our latest videos. Listen, we're an independent company and we appreciate all of your support.